all, welcome back to the EOF School. It is our last meeting and we are all looking forward for our in-person meeting in Assisi in next September. So don't miss uh, this fantastic opportunity to meet together and stay together. So after two years of remote working, we will be able to hug each other finally. Of course, we could have dreamed of a better international situation, but our meeting will be the occasion to reclaim the need for peace. We know, we all know that the world will be saved uh, by an increased level of cooperation, not an increased level of conflict or competition. Our meetings during the EOF school have shown it clearly. Competition exists, but becomes a leverage for the safeguard of our only planet, only if we create a higher level um, cooperation between us and between us and the world in which we are actually living. And with this knowledge that uh, we have acquired during our trip within the EOF school, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Simon Levin from Princeton University. Professor Levin received his BA from John Hopkins, Hopkins University and his PhD in mathematics from University of Maryland. Since 1992, he has been at Princeton University, what is currently James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor in ecology and evolutionary biology and director of the Center for Biocomplexity. On the top of that, which is already something, he retains an adjunct professorship at Cornell, at Cornell University and is currently distinguished professor, visiting professor at Arizona State University. His research interests are in understanding how macroscopic patterns and processes are maintained at the level of ecosystems and the biosphere in terms of ecological and evolutionary mechanisms that operate primarily at the levels of the organism, in infectious disease and the interface between basics and applied ecology. Professor Leving received a long list of honors. He was honored with the Dr. A. H. Anneken Prize for Environmental Sciences at the Royal uh, Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2004 and uh, also uh, by many other honors includes included the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award in Ecology and Conservation Biology this year in 2022. Professor Levin has also mentored more than 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and has published widely. He's the editor of the influential Princeton Guide to Ecology and the landmark Encyclo Encyclopedia of Biodiversity. Today, he will give us a lecture titled Public Goods from Biofilms to societies. So thank you, Professor Levin, for being uh, with us today. Before giving you the floor for your lecture, which we are really looking forward, let me remind uh, the people connected through our YouTube channel that one, you can write your questions in the YouTube chat. At the end of the lecture, we will collect, collect those questions and share, uh, if possible, those questions thank with you, Professor, Professor Levin. For being, uh, with and, us. Uh, before giving okay, you I have, uh, some, okay, that's fantastic. Then um, you, we, we will also share in the YouTube chat, the link to register your presence directly um, for the EOF, uh, EOF school. And then last uh, information, of course, as usually, we have uh, uh, a translation available in Spanish. You can find uh, it as usually. So dear Professor Levin, Thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. The floor is yours. We are looking forward for your presentation. Thank you, Valentin, very much for, for organizing this series uh, and for your introduction, which is a great introduction actually um, to what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and uh, here you see a picture taken over Rome of uh, a bunch of starlings, but I'll come back and show you that. Uh, in motion in a few minutes and also explain the reasons uh, why I, I'm, I'm showing it. I also want to thank all of the uh, agencies and people who have supported my work. Well, as you can tell from the title, all the way from microbial systems to socioeconomic systems, macroscopic patterns emerge from microscopic interactions. Beginning down with the cellular slime molds, in which my late uh, dear colleague, John Tyler Bonner was the world's expert, but 
all the way up to the society of which we are part, uh, we deal with individual agents who work together to produce some macroscopic uh, outcomes. Like these large animal aggregations of, of wildebeest um, in, in the Serengeti, these fantastic patterns that you see here um, that arise simply from one individual following a, another. Or going back to those uh, starlings, this amazing pattern that James Crombie took. Um, these are tens of thousands of starlings organized together into what looks like a giant starling, uh, which will scare off um, the, um, the predator. That's a public good. And, but how do these starlings organize themselves to do such things? Well, you're all familiar unfortunately, with the fact that uh, there are things called tumor cells that begin dividing at a rate much greater than they should, which gives them some short-term advantage over other cells, but bad for the, uh, for the organism as a whole, bad for us. That means there's a conflict between levels, and it's these conflicts between levels I'm going to explore today. Ultimately, tumor growth obviously is not good for the organism, uh, and the question is, are we cancers uh, on, on our biosphere? Um, these conflicts between levels create challenges for societies, between the interests of the individuals and the interests of societies, uh, and the need to scale from individuals to ensembles and back. So here you see that this, uh, thanks to Claudio uh, Carreri, I mistyped his name at the bottom there, sorry. Um, Th those amazing patterns um, of large numbers of starlings that organize themselves uh, in into these macroscopic patterns. So what can we learn from this? How can we achieve cooperation in the collective good? How does nature achieve it? Whether it's many uh, individual birds who organize themselves to deal with a larger predator, bird or many fish who do the same thing as in this picture here. And starling flocks, people who have studied them find that birds pay attention to about their seven nearest neighbors. And my colleague Naomi Leonard's group here, Naomi is a control theorist, showed that seven is about what would maximize the robustness of the group. That is, it would keep it together. That's a public good. Um, but what's best for the group may not be best for the individual. One of the earliest papers on this, uh, almost exactly 50 years ago, was by William Hamilton, called The Geometry for the Selfish Herd, which talked about the positions that individual birds try to achieve within a particular herd. So Naomi Leonard, whom I already mentioned, and I had a student a few years ago named Eleanor Brush, and we said to Eleanor, well, if seven is is the right thing for individual birds to pay attention to. Why should they do that? Why is that good for the individual bird? It's good for the group, but what should individual birds do? So she developed models as part of her PhD thesis that asked what would be the optimal thing for an individual bird to do? And she found some, that sometimes it is seven, but it depends on the task. You already saw them trying to escape a predator, but sometimes they organized together to search for food, and then the optimal organization, the optimal number of birds to pay attention to uh, is larger. So the, the question is, how do we resolve these conflicts between what's good for the individual and what's good for the group? Uh, how do we develop a collective intelligence? This is a paper that Naomi and I have, which uh, is just about to appear in a journal called Collective uh, Intelligence. Um, so public good problems uh, and um, so are, are, are also uh, are widespread in socioeconomic and ecological context. Um, and therefore, I think we can go back and forth between uh, the theories in evolutionary biology uh, and the theories in economics. Uh, it's no accident that economics and ecology both begin with eco, the Greek word for household. So whether one looks at the 
a famous book by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, or Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, we see some of the same sorts of uh, themes coming up. And in fact, Darwin was very puzzled about uh, why cooperation, uh, in particular extreme forms called altruism, arise at all. Indeed, ecology and economics are two sides of the same coin. Public goods and common pool resource problems are central not only in economics, which is familiar to all of us, but in ecology as well. I've already showed you the aggregations of birds. These happen to be reindeer. You saw wildebeest. They organize together and share information. That's a public good. We talked about tumors. Um, organisms in the ocean produce structures called siderophores, which help them to chelate or to set aside uh, critical elements that they were use. Plants draw water from a common pool. And if they draw it at too high a rate, uh, that's bad for, for all, uh, all of the plants. And we're supposed to learn from plants uh, in these lectures. So some sort of degree of prudence has to evolve in order for the ecosystem to maintain itself. This afternoon, unfortunately, I have to go visit my dentist. Um, even bacteria cooperate. That's what keeps dentists in business. They form biofilms, which sit on, the, on our teeth. Uh, and um, by, by sharing um, extracellular polymers that create a matrix for growth and provide them information. It, and that's how dental biofilms arise. We all know about antibiotics. Actually, we know about antibiotics in our societies and the fact that we overuse them. But plants also produce antibiotics. Uh, bacteria produce antibiotics to poison competitors. Now, if I'm a, a plant sitting next to a plant that's producing an antibiotic that's going to poison my enemies, I don't have to produce them myself. It's costly to produce them. I could just free ride on them as long as I develop resistance to those antibiotics. So these are public goods, and it's a puzzle as to how they are sustained. And of course, um, antibiotic use in our societies also involve public goods. Uh, we work a lot on this, but we're overusing um, uh, antibiotics in our society uh, and, and therefore reducing the good that, um, that they provide us. I'll come back to that, but the maintenance of cooperation in small societies, uh, as Lynn Ostrom, the late great Nobel Prize winner showed, depends on our developing norms, norms of conduct uh, that help us to govern and not overexploit resources locally. But, the, but Lynn Ostrom's work showed that this works for small societies. Can we enlarge, expand this to the global environment? Um, one particular norm that societies have uh, involves fairness. Fairness norms provides that mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. Inspired by Lynn, who was a collaborator of mine, um, with Alessandro uh, Tavoni, an economist who's now at Bologna, um, and Maya Schluter, who is at the Stockholm Resilience Center, we developed a model in which individuals could withdraw from a common pool uh, at different rates, uh, one possibility would be for them to withdraw at very selfish rates, but that would overexploit the resource. They would all be better off if they withdrew at a slightly lower rate. But how do they achieve this? Well, they develop norms. Um, they, um, in our model, ostracize individuals who overuse the resource. Uh, and one of the things we showed in this model, uh, I won't take you through the mathematics of the model, is <clears throat> that if you look at the degree of selfishness uh, on the vertical axis, if this were a one, that would mean that the selfish individuals were not withdrawing any more than the, um, the, than the, the cooperating individuals. But if it's, say, three, that means they are withdrawing at three times the rate. And on the bottom axis is the frequency of cooperators, those who agree to withdraw at a lower rate and agree to punish those who withdraw at the higher rate. And what we showed is if you could get the number of cooperators above a threshold level, then you could achieve 
a more cooperative equilibrium, sustaining the resource for longer. Well, that's really what we've got to do in, uh, in maintaining our global environment. Let me give you another example. This is work with the economist Avadash Dixit and with my uh, ecological colleague, Dan Rubenstein, who works, in fact, he's there now in Kenya uh, on um, herdsmen. And one of the phenomena is that herdsmen share grazing grounds. In other words, if I have a, a ranch and I'm having a bad weather conditions this year, not enough water, uh, not enough crops to feed my cattle, I ask my neighbor, can I send my uh, cattle over to graze on your land? And my neighbor has to say, well, why should I do that? And I say, well, next year, the situation can might be reversed. So let me show you a little bit of mathematics here. The, the basic framework we use to model this is, let's suppose that both herdsmen could have good years or bad years. In a, in a good year, the yield for their crop is A sub H. In the bad year, A sub L. And therefore, we compute um, what the overall yield would be. And once we know that, we say that if one of us is having a good year and the other a bad year, we can move a certain number of cattle from the, the bad to the good. Uh, we both make investments, X and Z, in cattle and land, and we, we compute the social optimum. This is a repeated game. So this is the hardest mathematical equation I'm going to put up today. Um, but the total payoff would be, if this is in ranch one, uh, this is what's called a Cobb-Douglas function, um, it would be X to the alpha, Z to the beta, but if we've moved M cattle over to the, the good land, so it's X1, which is the number of cattle in the good land, plus M to the alpha, Z1 to the beta, and a similar term uh, for the, the second ranch, but where the number of cattle is depleted by M. And then there's a cost function based on our investments. And what we do is based on this, we calculate what transfer of M would optimize the collective benefit. Okay, we know what the collective benefit is, but, but will the two ranchers uh, agree to this, the two herdsmen? Will the herdsman who's got the good land this year um, accept the cattle from, uh, from the other property? Well, it depends on his discount rate. In other words, it depends on how much he cares about next year to, um, in relationship to this year. So it may or may not be a Nash equilibrium, which in a game theoretic sense, means it may or may not be sustainable. But what if it's not? He may say to me, um, it's not a good deal for me, but um, what if I let you send me just 10 of your cows? And I know that that means that next year I can only send you 10 of my cows if I'm in a similar situation. That's called a second best solution. And so this um, pattern, compute the social optimum, Ask if it's sustainable in a game theoretic sense. And if not, what's the second best solution we could find is a model for what we have to do in dealing with global environmental problems uh, as well. We probably can't achieve the optimum, but we can certainly do better than everybody being selfish. Uh, there's another ingredient, of course, which is I might care about, um, I'm, if I have the good property, I might care about the uh, herdsman on the other property. So kinship and more generally pro-sociality can be important. I might care about um, what's my friend on the next ranch. And so that modifies the calculation. Pro-sociality is a very important part of this. Um, it's something we have to achieve. Why do we have pro-sociality? Well, this is the first paper I know about it in the journal Rationality and Society by Herbert Gintis. But, um, but Avinash Dixit and I, have developed a similar model, which explains how we can develop pro-sociality, caring about others in our society. And, and basically in, in this, we, we play a game theory, we deal with a game theoretic situation, but basically what happens here is that we rec the model recognizes that pro-sociality facilitates cooperation um, and, um, and therefore, um, because of this, I'm willing to invest now 
in education and laws that will protect the situation for my children because I know it will create a, a better world. So we show in this model how pro-sociality can be selected for because it will leave my offspring with a better life. Um, so going back to nature, not just plants, but what can we learn from animal flocks like these fish schools or the bird flocks or the, um, or the reindeer that you saw on the bottom? Um, what can human societies learn from nature? What can we do better? What can we add? Uh, what is the wisdom of, of uh, crowds? We have an advantage over um, bird flocks and that we have mathematical models. We can make predictions. We can calculate. Um, we know that climate change is bad now. It's going to get worse in the future. We know that we're losing biodiversity. We know that we're going to have uh, other pandemics. We should do something about it. We're not very good at that but we should be able to do even better than other species. The question is, will we? Here's a paper we had come out last year, uh, a, a group of us in which I led, called Governance in the Face of Extreme Events, what we can learn from evolutionary processes and why we need to do more. Because evolution is largely a reactive process. We have to utilize our capability to make predictions. There are urgent challenges facing us. We're all sitting still in a, in a pandemic and the Valentina offered hope that by the fall, things will be better. They're better than they were, uh, but there are gonna be a lot of global health crises, climate change, biodiversity loss. Um, I've already talked about antibiotics and the loss of their effectiveness. We know all of uh, the, the politics that's gone on with regard to vaccination and mask wearing fascinating um, uh, issue. We published a paper uh, two years ago, um, which looked at the economic and behavioral factors that influence um, vaccination and antimicrobial use. Why is it that um, many people are opposed to the use of vaccination, but are more likely to overuse an antibiotics? Part of the answer is, we take antibiotics usually when we're already sick and we're asked to vaccinate when we're not feeling sick, but it's more complicated than that. Indeed, a lot of it has to do with politics and social dynamics. I'm not gonna talk about it, but we just came out with a special issue of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States um, on the dynamics of political polarization. And you see some of it here. This is from the US of course, but which groups are most likely to be hesitant or resistant to, get, to getting vaccines? Look at what's at the top and at the bottom in the US. 42% of Republicans uh, are hesitant to get vaccinated. 12% of Democrats are hesitant. I would never have predicted that before uh, the total, um, um, before the current pandemic. Uh, look at the differences in age groups. Um, people. 65 and over are quite willing to get it. They know the risks. Uh, people 18 to 29, just about in the middle. But the middle-aged people, 30 to 49, there's a fair degree <coughs> of resistance. We can look at this in a different way. Look at it by a country by country level. Um, anybody who's traveled in the Far East uh, knows that even before uh, of the current pandemic, during flu season, mask wearing was quite common. And obviously during the current pandemic uh, in China, in Japan, in Hong Kong, and Taiwan, uh, um, people are um, likely to wear masks. At the opposite extreme, look at the bottom in, in the Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, and Finland, nobody ever wore masks before and they still don't in those countries. And then there are a group of countries um, like um, Italy uh, and the United States and Spain and France, in which mask wearing was not the norm, but now um, it was during the pandemic. Not so much anymore, but this was taken um, some time ago, but I still wear a mask when I go into a public setting. So there was a, um, a phase shift and we've modeled 
that working um, with a, a number of economists and particularly the Swedish economist, Jürgen Weibel, Avinash uh, Dixik and the Cornell economist, Kaushik Basu. Um, this, one of these papers has just appeared. This is it. It's uh, available online in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and, uh, but we've got others uh, along the way. And what we've built here is a norm model where individuals are um, influenced by their friends and neighbors, uh, and we understand how these, uh, how these norms can change. So let me begin to draw things to a close. Scientific consensus is strong on many core environmental issues, in particular climate change, but we haven't taken adequate action to address them. Why is that? It's not because we don't know the scientific answers, but it's rather because people and governments have not been willing to commit to the common good. That's why we have so much trouble um, with um, agreements on climate change. And um, my, my own government um, has, has not been a stellar leader uh, in this. Um, and countries have not been willing to cooperate in finding solutions that benefit everyone. This shows you some of these cross-country comparisons. This is a rather old study now, but um, if you look at a variety of questions like whether uh, climate change is a real thing, whether it's our fault, whether we can do anything about it, whether we should, if you look at any of these boxes, but let's pick this one, you'll see that in China, 96% of the people in this survey, uh, which I think was from the Pew Foundation, uh, believe that humans um, are responsible for the increase. 94% in Sweden, which has a very different political system. In the US, only 73%, rather discouraging. Look at this in a different way. This is just the US. In 2008, about 51% of the people in the US were either alarmed or concerned about climate change. That dropped suddenly uh, in 2010 to 39% because there was a financial crisis and people thought we'll worry about climate change later. They were discounting the future. Um, by 2016, it was back up nearly to where it was. And um, in 2020, it was back to where, um, to where it was in 2008. It's all about social norms and social attitudes. They're key. Uh, and as Paul Ehrlich and I wrote uh, 15 years ago, social norms can change very rapidly. We've seen it with regard to for example, smoking in public places. We're seeing it to some extent with regard to gender equality, racial um, e equality, uh, et cetera. The question is, can we make those changes when it comes to climate change? Can cooperation be extended to the global level? Uh, Lynn Ostrom, in one of the last papers she wrote just before she passed away, after she won the Nobel Prize, this was, she argued for what uh, she and her husband, Vincent Ostrom, called a polycentric approach for coping with climate change, by which she meant you can't get 200 countries to agree all at once, but maybe you can build smaller agreements that can be building blocks to the larger agreements. And with Andrew Tillman, my student, and Avinash Dixit, uh, we've developed models that look at the development um, of cooperation within groups based on pro-sociality and the leakage of benefits to other groups uh, and, and show how cooperation can emerge. It's a little more complicated. Um, for example, when we're dealing with nations, nations have interlocking memberships. They're not organized into groups that are part of bigger groups. Um, they're organized into groups that overlap other groups. Um, for, for example, the US belongs to um, obviously the United Nations, but to NATO, to the World Health Organization. And every decision that's taken uh, involves trade-offs uh, between all of these memberships. That, that applies to us as well. Uh, we have uh, friends and family. We have our, um, our, our colleagues at work, et cetera. We belong to multiple groups and our decisions depend upon all of those memberships. Um, with uh, uh, Vitor Vasconcelos and uh, George Pacheco from uh, Portugal, 
Uh, and Philip Hannum, a, a student, a former student at, at Princeton, we published a couple of papers that build on models of this sort. I'll give you just one example of that sort of model and, uh, and, and then uh, close, but where we show that uh, these multiple memberships can make cooperation uh, easier. Um, with Vitor and Elke Weber um, and uh, Sarah Constantino, um, we uh, have been building models and trying to understand rapid change with regard to decarbonization. Uh, and here we allow individuals to belong to groups. Those groups have norms and stances. Uh, the individuals have attitudes and, uh, and take actions um, based on their attitudes. And they change their attitudes and actions based on their interactions with other individuals and based on the norms of the groups to which they belong. On longer timescales, the norms of those groups change and individuals indeed might change groups. So this is the approach that we've taken to it. It's a, a very much an economics approach. So to conclude, can cooperation be extended to the global level? The question I posed a bit earlier. We see a lot of cooperation. Um, evolutionary biology focuses on cooperation, but unfortunately the emergence of cooperation within groups has often evolved for the benefit of conflict with other groups to allow us to outcompete other groups. We've got to realize that there are no other groups. Uh, in the comic strip character, Pogo is, um, and his friend mentions to him, it's hard working on all this stuff, I could say junk. And Pogo, the comic strip character is, yep, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, and we've got to realize in the global common, there is no other enemy. And we've got to um, find ways to cooperate uh, across different nationalities, across different peoples, because finding that kind of cooperation is at the core of achieving sustainability and dealing with our common, common enemy, which is environmental degradation, so that we can achieve a sustainable future for our children and for our grandchildren. So thanks very much. I think I stay within my 30 minutes and I'd be delighted to engage in uh, conversation now. Professor, thank you so much for this um, uh, amazing lecture you gave, you gave us. And incidentally, let me know that, let me um, tell you that uh, some of the people you have cited during, the, you, during your uh, presentation were actually our hosts during some uh, previous uh, oh, sessions of the UF School, um, or, or colleagues of us, which are really uh, well, well known within, within our, our networks like uh, Tavoni or, or yeah. others. Um, and, the ones that, and the ones that you haven't, maybe you can get for next year. Of course, of course, we will, we will grasp uh, these, uh, these intuitions and uh, invite, uh, invite other people. Let me um, just take uh, this opportunity to start the Q&A uh, question. Uh, with, uh, with a question or, or a comment uh, uh, from uh, my side. And uh, um, let me just uh, recall you, colleagues, which are connecting either through via Zoom or via YouTube, that you can uh, uh, share your questions in the chat and we'll, uh, um, give this, uh, these questions to uh, Professor Levin. So um, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, like uh, this way of increasing uh, cooperation or achieving uh, this uh, so far incomplete cooperation in terms of uh, of uh, climate change. You mentioned the fact that actually being involved in several different groups can help uh, achieving cooperation because you, uh, from, from a social, socioeconomic point of view, we might say that these weak ties transfer from one group to another and build a higher level of cooperation until, until the point when we will realize that actually there is only one group to which uh, we belong. And this group is the humanity, let's say, no? and uh, we have only one planet to save. We don't have any other planet B on which we can, uh, we can, uh, we can live. But the question um, arises or, or comes to my mind is, uh, how can we actually um, motivate people to be part in several different group, groups in a situation in which uh, we see uh, a higher level of polarization and which people in which people 
specifically through, for instance, social media, tends to be like relegated in small groups and tends to find only people similar to them uh, in order to uh, avoid the confrontation with the uh, different uh, ideas. So we cannot force people to be part of several different groups okay. as a policy, uh, policy mean to achieve uh, a higher level of uh, cooperation. So how would you like uh, nudge people to be part of different groups and therefore achieve a higher level of cooperation? So I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer to it, because, but I will say that you put your finger on exactly the problem in in this um, in this special issue on polarization that I mentioned, uh, I'm part of one paper um, which is based on an analysis of the principles behind the establishment of the United States Constitution. One of the main people there was James Madison, who wrote the Federalist Papers. And he believed that the system that he had developed would allow for, or that they had developed would allow for people who were interested in many different issues to avoid forming political parties that would polarize the society. He was right that political parties were the real threat to cooperation. He was wrong that the system uh, would prevent it. So obviously in the United States, we have a, an increasingly polarized society, uh, which makes cooperation difficult, uh, which reduces the dimensionality of the system. Uh, one can compare to, I'm, I'm not sure it works better, but compare to some to, to other countries which have more parliamentary systems. A lot of the European countries um, um, and, and, and Israel and the places like that have parties that care they have multiple parties because they're uh, focused on a smaller number of issues, but none, nonetheless, the dynamics of those system forces al alliances uh, that tend to polarize societies. So, and other papers in this special issue focus on, on exactly the things that you said and more, which is um, basically that in, in with the, um, the rapid growth of the internet uh, and the polarization of television networks as well, um, we, we, st I, we see that uh, we develop what are called echo chambers uh, and people on the left only listen to left-wing uh, television stations or only go to left-wing um, social media sites and people on the right do uh, exactly the opposite. And that's just increased the polarization. So I'm afraid that you've identified exactly what the problem is and that I don't have an answer except to, to say that that we've got to find ways to, uh, to overcome the polarization because that is the our greatest threat to solving not only climate change, but a whole suite of problems that are confronting uh, society. Our special issue was a first attempt to try to um, clarify the issues. Um, uh, we've one of the things that the the papers um, distinguishes between the populace and what's called the elite, which means, for example, um, people who are government leaders. But I would also include um, television. Uh, personalities and business leaders. Um, my hope, um, I've, I've been um, dedicating more effort to the um, uh, to the business sector uh, because I, I my I believe that to be less polarized. A lot of corporations are multinational, and I think that there's some leverage to be gained by convincing companies that it's in their own self-interest uh, to take a, um, a, a more global view of sustainability. And I'm seeing some promising trends there. I think once we do that, um, we may have some more leverage with governments. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think there is a question which is uh, super related 
to uh, your last sentences. So Dr. Tafuro is uh, asking you, uh, in your opinion, who is the main actor in the society that should drive uh, international cooperation against climate change? Is the state, business world, or the society? So in part you replied, but if um, you want to enrich a little bit your uh, um, your point of view on this. Well, it's, I mean, it's a great question. Obviously these co-evolve uh, and um, I, I would, um, you know, I certainly I would, maybe break down business because I would put the social media and things of that sort uh, as, as yet a, a, another element. Um, ultimately, we um, I think we've, um, we've got to create movements um, in civil society in which people demand changes. But in the short run, um, I, I think that um, I, I, we have to be working at all levels, but that... Um, uh, but I see some openings in the business sector. We see companies you know, using these env environmental sustainable goals, the ESGs, uh, that um, uh, that um, govern their practice. Uh, ultimately, obviously, we've, we're going to have to convince politicians. I'm afraid that seems to me the hardest task. But but hopefully, if uh, if we can convince people. Uh, you know, and, and the sort of work you're doing and Greta Thunberg and others um, will ultimately have a, you know, impacts on their societies. Um, it's all about norm change. And, uh, uh, and, and so I'm certainly working at the, at the business level and at the level of civil society at the same time uh, is, is where I think the initial points of leverage um, it may exist, but it's a great question. Thank you, Professor. So there's another question from the audience. Dr. Gabriele say, ask you, uh, if are there any behavior you can uh, select from the kingdom of plants, we can learn from and uh, apply to um, our, let's say, uh, attitudes towards society? Yeah, well, I, all of the things I talked about um, apply not only to animals, but to plants. Uh, and not only to plants, but to microorganisms uh, as well. The biofilms, for example, uh, these are not plants, but the biofilms uh, that uh, I talked about that create um, create the plaque on on your teeth uh, are cooperative uh, uh, enterprises uh, in, involving uh, bacteria in which they um, invest in these extracellular polymers. I talked about plants producing um, uh, antibiotics plants also fix nitrogen. They do that through a partnership with microorganisms. Uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, ambient nitrogen is not usable by the plants. It has to be converted into a usable form. Um, that's called fixation. But if I, if I fix nitrogen and then I drop my leaves on the ground and you're a plant next to me, you can derive some benefit from from that. So um, that behavior has to evolve. Uh, it, it's a, it's a cooperative um, behavior. So there there are lots of examples from the plant community as well, both involving uh, cooperative behavior and also the production of antibiotics, which um, is a cooperative uh, has to evolve as a cooperative behavior because the cheaters are punished and because um, um, free riders um, can, can get by just as in any, any game theoretic situation. So those are some of the best examples I know, but, but think about the fact that our ecosystems uh, could not be sustained were it not for the cycling of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon uh, in our systems. Plants are, and microorganisms together are responsible for doing that, it's it's an emergent property. It's a, and so a lot of our work is in trying to understand how those macroscopic ecosystem properties are sustained, um, and what we can learn from them for sustaining the cycling of uh, food and uh, um, and capital uh, in in our global society. So we have a lot to learn from plants and microorganisms. Thank you. So we have another question coming from uh, Dr. Bayer, who asks, how about norm change through protests and group of people 
uh, who go public to demand the change. How effective is that in uh, your point of view? I think it's absolutely essential. Obviously, they, um, they need to be peaceful protests, but we have lots of examples uh, through history. We know about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, we know about changes in South Africa. We know about um, um, changes with regard to um, racial equality in many places in the world. These are not always effective. These are not sufficient, but I think they're... Um, they're necessary, um, and they can come about through multiple ways. There can be marches, uh, but they can be letter campaigns. There can be people contacting their elected representatives, uh, but these are going to be essential. Uh, and, and it's not just convincing the decision makers, but convincing other people to join. Uh, once uh, once there's enough momentum, I hope well, we will see uh, um, changes when it comes uh, to climate climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, we have to be careful, of course, that we don't uh, do what's called greenwashing, that, that we get some changes and people said, okay, we've done it now. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, we, we, I mean, if, it, when it, it's amazing to me this hasn't happened sooner. When we look around the world at the increasing levels of, um, uh, of drought, uh, of catastrophic weather conditions, um, of flooding, uh, of wildfires, that people are not demanding the changes, but they will. Uh, and the sooner, the better. Um, we take uh, the last question from the audience. There are several, but we take the last one. Sorry, but we are running out of time. And then we leave uh, Professor Bruni uh, uh, moments to give us a uh, um, few, few words about, uh, about this lesson. So the last question we take from... Uh, from the audience is this one. How does local cooperation contribute to global cooperation? You talked about global and local cooperation, but which one should come first? Yeah, and, and, and as I look at uh, uh, Dr. Piccarillo's um, uh, point, it's, it's sort of the same question where he asks about horizontal and vertical collaboration. Well, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in what Lynn Ostrom uh, argued, which was that the local cooperation is, has to be uh, the starting point. You've got to, uh, you've got to build, and, and this might be um, a small number of countries, but also within countries, within uh, regions. Uh, you get interest groups that, uh, that believe deeply in something, they create, uh, a, a unified block, which then is a building block. So um, I, don't, I don't know, he asks about reducing costs. I don't know about that, but, uh, but I think it's the, it, it, uh, it will be the, not only the most effective, but probably the only way that one uh, is, is ever gonna get the changes to build the local cooperation first. And, and as Lynn Ostrom showed that, uh, we can do that. that that's um, a, a well-established way to do it. So thank you, Professor Levin. I can uh, say that it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic lecture. And was, uh, let's say it was really the, the last uh, part of our trip within this, uh, this team. And hopefully for the next, uh, for the years to come, we can uh, uh, work together and try to uh, enlarge our competencies uh, uh, with the only aim save the only planet we have uh, we, yeah. we don't have uh, another one so from uh, the side of the economy of francesco big thank you uh, for your uh, for your time and uh, for your competence and also for your patience in, <laughs> in explaining us uh, what it was uh, your research and the research of your colleagues so far thank you so much well thank thank you thank you for all you're doing and i look forward to meeting in person Thank you for the same year. So, Professor Bruni, thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Lugino. Um, the floor is yours. I'm just, uh, I'm just adding my personal own um, thank you to Professor Levin uh, for his very inspiring uh, uh, lecture, in particular about uh, who, probably the uh, important link between uh, the um, first year EOF school on commons, uh, this year on uh, on plants. 
because uh, the commons, the, the, the collective uh, pool, the, the, the collective re common resources uh, are actually one link uh, between the two years of school. Then, in, uh, starting from that, I would like to thank you, you also, Valentina and Paolo, uh, all the staff for organizing this not easy uh, series of conferences on a, a topic not so popular yet among economists. Uh, and it's a really interdisciplinary topic, uh, a genuine uh, transdisciplinary um, way of uh, making research. And uh, then um, this idea that there is no planet B is something very serious because uh, if uh, as individuals we can run away as, a, as animals, but uh, as a humanity we cannot uh, <laughs> We cannot run anymore because there is not a planet B. And then we have to start to learn from uh, the intelligence uh, of plants how to, re to survive without running away. And then this idea that we have to, to start uh, a new kind of intelligence globally, because uh, as a humanity, as humankind, uh, as, a, uh, as a people of the world, uh, we have we are really entering uh, we have already entered into a new era the era of no planet b uh, then uh, we have to really change the paradigm of economics because economics remains very much uh, stuck to the idea of uh, the uh, the animal paradigm we so robust this idea that we are we think as animal we represent the world as animals and so and so we can in this moment we must probably start to learn in another way and the, and the intelligence of plants uh, are, is a very um, in terrific uh, source of uh, inspirations and ideas. Then thank you to Professor Levin, thank you to all the other colleagues and professors that have prepared, have uh, given gratuitously also thank you for that because we know how much your precious is your time. And then uh, the other colleagues, uh, thank you to all the young scholars, uh, Tens of young scholars then uh, have animated, uh, enriched, and um, uh, given a very, very important, uh, deep contribution to the, this reality of, of, of youth, of young economists. That is the, the most important element of this network of Economy of Francesco. Then we now are preparing the global event in a season in September. All of you are invited, of course, including professors, and that will be a celebration it will be a festa with uh, with every with everybody and then uh, just to conclude uh, really conclude um, the plants uh, the, the the vegetal world uh, is also important in the francesco francesco san francesco of assisi life we know that uh, there are uh, many elements of his uh, of his, uh, there are many moments of his life uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the memories uh, of his uh, brothers about uh, the special relationships with the nature, not only the Lodato Si, brother, son, and sister Moon, eh? Fratello Sole, Sorella Luna, but also the famous experience when he took uh, uh, a branch uh, of a tree it transformed in a sort of violin and he started to, song, to, to sing a song using this, uh, this uh, branch of the tree as a violin. In this uh, brotherhood that is uh, huge, is uh, greater than uh, human brotherhood. And also, I think uh, this is just a way to, to say thank you and to, give, and to, and to, to, to tell, and to, to say to all of you, Arrivederci in Assisi and goodbye. So thank you. This uh, session and this uh, EOF uh, school uh, came to an end. Thank you to all the administrative staff. Thank you to all the young scholars. Thank you to all professors. See you in Assisi. Thank you. Grazie. Bye bye. Gracias. Hasta luego. Ciao. Bye bye.